So welcome everyone to the Pastors Forum for Hawaii Pacific Pastors. And it's a delight to introduce Brian Croft to you. Uh, Brian is the former senior pastor of the Auburndale Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And if you don't, uh, if you haven't already had the chance, I want to encourage you to go look at the invitation that I sent you guys. And on the About Brian Croft page, he talks about uh, his experience at Auburndale. But he doesn't talk about the great experience he's talked about. I think they they tried to fire you three times, right? Three times in five years. In yep. five years. And it's a mm -hmm. it's a great video. So you need to go back and watch that if you haven't already seen it. Um, good, good transparency. We're grateful for that. And now he is the... Uh, the founder and executive director of Practical uh, Shepherding, along with senior fellow for Mathena Center for Church Revitalization, adjunct professor at Southern. And uh, I know there's a lot of books that you've written or contributed to. I think we saw on the website is 25 of them. And the one that I'm uh, super excited about that I want you guys to make sure you know about is this brand new one that they've been working on for 10 years. And I think it's a compilation of a lot of the other stuff that you've done through the years. And it's called Practically Trained Pastors. And it's basically 52 weeks of training uh, that if you had either for yourself personally or for a younger pastor, if you took them through this once a week, uh, there's very very simple, but very practical and very biblical counsel. And so I encourage you guys to take a look at that. There's a link in that uh, invite that I sent you. I know uh, my son has a call to ministry and, I, and we're on chapter three tomorrow. We've been uh, going through this for three weeks. So that's my endorsement mm -hmm. of it. But I'm going to, I just saw that Chris Komatsu, our newest pastor, is joining us. Welcome, Chris. Chris is the new pastor on Lanai Baptist. Um, you all be sure to uh, read the article that Robert Miller wrote about the Komatsu family. It's going to be in the next Pacific Connector that you'll get in about three days. So, uh, Chris, since you're the brand new pastor, could you open us in prayer, Chris Komatsu? Yes, sir. Yeah. Let's pray. Kyokua, you are a good God. Um, Lord, I, I pray that through this time, you would help us to be humble, that we would see our weakness, so that, that we might see plenty of opportunity for the power of Jesus to be perfected in us. Um, Lord, I, I pray that, that you would help all of us to love and shepherd the flocks that you have given us well. Um, please, Lord, uh, walk with us. And uh, use this time, and 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 we we pray, Lord, that that you would break out revival in Hawaii again. We pray all things in the name of Jesus. And amen. It's all yours, Brian. Okay, gentlemen, great to see you. What a great group! So uh, thanks for having me on. It's a joy to be with you and meet uh, meet each of you. So, um, Craig Craig asked me to address uh, kind of pastor family stuff. As you guys, I know, are going through some different areas, so I want to be able to stay in, the, stay in my lane and in, in what I've been asked to do. But I want to give a little bit of context to my my ministry story to, before I kind of launch into why I would I would share a few things around the pastor's family that I that I want to share. Uh, as Craig mentioned, part of my story, I've been a pastor for 25 years. I spent eight years doing associate pastor work in uh, just a variety of different churches. And then I went to be the senior pastor of Auburndale Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky uh, in 2003. And I ended up being the pastor there for 17 years. And the video that Craig's referring to just tells the story of the first five years, which were quite eventful. Um, I was told I was going into a, a tough place, but I didn't realize how tough it would be. I went into a, a church that was uh, on its last leg, about 30 elderly folks in there. 70s, 80s, and 90s, the church was in financial shambles. The building was falling down around us. They, we figured probably about two or three, it had about two or three years left if nothing changed. And I went in and um, had been taught, you know, to, to, to preach the word, love the people, go in and, um, and just shepherd people and see if God would, would work through that, build his church through his word. And that's what I went in to do. But it was a pretty hostile place I walked into. So there were three different movements to get me fired. 
uh, in the first five years of the church. That's its whole story. And that video tells a little bit of it. But the first one was at three months. Uh, the second one was at two and a half years. The third one was at year five. And year five almost just kind of blew the church up. Um, and uh, after surviving all that, the smoke cleared. About 30% of the church had left at that time. We ran out of money. The bank account actually hit zero. And in year five, um, at the end of all that, at the ripe age of 34 years old, I started having uh, health issues that came up, a, a heart issue that I still have to monitor to this day, showed up in my life in that time. And the docs eventually diagnosed it as just this accumulated stress overall that we had gone through in those years. And so, that, but that's not the end of the story because um, in year six, the, the church just shifted and, and started to flourish. It was, it was just mysterious, almost like God. Uh, I'm convinced to this day that God had, had, didn't just make the best of those first five years. He, he providentially ordained them for me to mold and shape me, to do what he needed to do in our church. And, uh, and it was part of his plan. And what happened the next five years after that is a lot of the people who were after me in those early years, the people who were trying to run, pull a group together, get me fired. A lot of those people, most of them stayed at the church. And God, the next five years, redeemed, re redeemed all of our relationships. And so some of the some of the people, when I left after 17 years of ministry there last year, some of the dearest people to me were actually the people who were trying to get me fired the first five years and stayed at the church. And, uh, and God just redeemed our relationships. So there's a God really, really at work. And I always want to share that part of my story. But the reason I want to give a little bit of that context is that I had some really hard, uniquely hard ministry in those first five years. It took a toll on me personally as my health started to, in my, my mid-30s, starting to have health issues. But the other thing that happened, as you can imagine, is that that took quite a toll on my family. And that's one of the things I just want to put out there is that I think ministry is uniquely hard. There's unique joys in ministry, but there's the unique hardship and difficulty in pastoral ministry. And one of the things that I noticed it, it, it has a primary effect on two things. It has a primary effect on us as men, as human beings, but then it has a, a direct effect on our wife if we're married and our children if we have children. You know, one of the things that uh, in those early years, thankfully, my kids were too young to really remember those hostile early years, but there were people who went after my kids. So there were, you know, my kids endured some of the, th some of the pretty harsh things that people were were doing to not just me, but, but took it out on them. And thankfully they don't remember that stuff. Um, but I just want to put that out there and start there that I think each of you, I just want to encourage you to know that um, I think without exception, regardless on how much we even try to shelter our families from the hardships of ministry, it takes a toll on our families. And I'm convinced that every pastor and his family, they, the, there's, a, there's a shelf life each family uniquely can only take so much, depending on how hard ministry is, depending on what kind of wife you have, depending on what kind of kids you have. And, and I just want to put that out there that I think all of us, whether we, regardless of where we are in our families, regardless whether we have young, young kids or older kids, whatever, kids out of the house, um, I think we have to always be looking and thinking about how our pastoral ministries are affecting our wife, affecting our kids. So when I wrote the Pastor's Family book 10 years ago, I had, I had teenagers and I had uh, preteens and younger kids. Well, now, I mean, I have three of my four kids are, are, are adults now. And so, I mean, there, there's been a whole nother experience the last 10 years with my kids. And I see in my adult kids, the effects of even early years of ministry that I did. So I just want to put that on everybody's radar. I think all of our families are in different places. And it's why the main thing I want to focus on in our time is, is how God calls us. Part of our calling as pastors is to make sure we prioritize caring well for our families as we're in the ministry because if we don't we can't stay in the ministry it's a prerequisite to be able to do the work that we're called to do so i got three texts i want to look at if you got a bible i just want to i want to hit these uh, just briefly i assume you'll be familiar with first peter five is the first one i want to look at first peter five <clears throat> first four verses of first peter five Again, I, I assume you guys will be familiar with these texts, but I want to read all three of them together because I'm going to, I'm going to make a point by piecing them together. 
for you to see that. First Peter five, Peter's writing, uh, he, he says, I exhort the elders as an elder. He's talking about pastors, elders, pastors, same office in the New Testament. Um, so first Peter five, verses one through four says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. The chief imperative in, command in that verse, those verses, that passage, is verse two. Peter is writing to the pastors and saying, your main task is to shepherd the flock of God that is among you. And, and just know that's where I'm coming from. And when I, when I think about pastoral ministry, there's tons of things that obviously, as you guys know, fit into a pastor's ministry, but it all fits under the umbrella of shepherding. Uh, preaching is a big part of what we do, but preaching, as you guys know, it is not the only thing that comes with pastoral ministry. I, I, get, I teach part-time at a seminary. There's tons of seminary students right now at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, who think the majority of pastoral ministry is just about preaching. And it's just not. You guys know that because you're pastors and you're living in the middle of it. But I just want to highlight, I believe that the, the number one command of every pastor to define the work of a pastor is verse two. You shepherd the flock of God that is among you in that flock that God has given you. So, and, and we do it on behalf of the chief shepherd. So that's, that's up points to verse four. Then he explains how you shepherd the flock. And then he says, it's, it's on behalf of the chief shepherd, Jesus. So we are under shepherds of the chief shepherd and we're called to shepherd the flock. So keep that in mind. Go back just a couple of pages, Hebrews 13, go to Hebrews 13, 17, one verse. Hebrews 13, 17 says, this, the writer of Hebrews is writing to Christians, but in the midst of him writing to Christians, we see a big piece to the paradigm of pastoral ministry in it. Verse 17, he says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So the writer of Hebrews is writing these discouraged Christians to obey and submit to your leaders because referring to the pastors, they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. So when you take 1 Peter 5 and you take Hebrews 13, 17, and you put them together, you get a stunning paradigm for pastoral ministry. And it's this, a pastor's call is to shepherd the flock of God on behalf of the chief shepherd in such a way that we're going to give an account for souls to the chief shepherd one day. So that flock you have, each individual soul in that flock, at least those who were there who profess to follow Christ and walk with Christ, we will give an account for each individual soul that has been entrusted to our care. Now, that is a really weighty definition, a brief one of the paradigm of what I believe pastoral ministry is all about. <clears throat> Take that paradigm and turn to the third text, and that's 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. You guys will know this as the clear qualifications that Paul writes to Timothy to say, this is what a pastor is supposed to be. This is what a deacon is supposed to be. Chapter three is has got both of those offices and the and the descriptions of what qualifies a pastor and a deacon. And I want you to notice. I want to read verses one through seven. This is a trustworthy. This saying is trustworthy. So it's talking about the pastors, overseer, same office. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer, pastor, must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must ma manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may pu be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Verses four and five is what I want to draw your attention to. So we take that paradigm of shepherding, caring for souls, giving an account for those souls. 
in our flock. Then we come to 1 Timothy 3, and we see that to even qualify to be a pastor, we must be faithful to our one wife, manage our household well, caring well, shepherding our children. So 1 Timothy 3 is really important in understanding this paradigm and how our families fit in it, because our family is a part of our flock that we are to shepherd and have oversight over and to care for, that we'll give an account for. So here's the implication, the main implication I just want to point to for you, for us in this conversation. We're called to shepherd every individual soul in our congregation and give an account for them as pastors. If it's a prerequisite to even be a pastor, to care for our families, then by implication, our families must be the first ones that we will give an account for before we give an account for one person in our church. And this realization hit me years ago, and it totally changed the way I viewed and understood how I was supposed to care for my family as a pastor, as a husband, as a father. And that is, is that through these three, take these three texts, piece them together. I will give an account to Jesus for how well I've cared for the souls of my wife and my children before one church member. And when I, when that hit me, it, it was stunning the way it affected me and the way I viewed the priority that my family is supposed to be. I want to highlight that and make that main implication. And here's why you guys know it as well as I do. Uh, the cliche is that the pastor puts his family on the, this, the altar of sacrifice for the sake of ministry. And so often I, I get to work with hundreds of pastors all over the world. And there are, there are so many pastors that think in the name of ministry that I am to somehow sacrifice my family. Now, there are sacrifices that come with ministry. We all know that. Our families, that's part of life in the ministry. And our families need to understand that. Our wives understand that. So this is not saying that there's not going to be sacrifice. There certainly is. And there's unique sacrifice, I would say, for the family of a pastor. However, uh, that's why I believe that pastors have to be really aware of what's going on inside of them. You know, so it goes back to what are the things that make us maybe neglect our families? Because a lot of times it's it's fearing what people think or trying to meet certain expectations or all kinds of things that would make us kill ourselves in our ministry. Not necessarily because we're dedicated. We may be dedicated, but we're driven by other things that maybe are not godly, that are not driven by the, the Holy Spirit of God at work in us, but they're driven by insecurities and fears and other things. And what drives us away from caring for our families well. So I just want to bring to your attention, one, that I think there's a clear biblical in, uh, reality for pastors to need to prioritize the care of the family, not just for the family's sake, that's true, but also to even qualify to be a pastor in the first place. So I want to put that before you. Uh, I want to throw a couple of practical just helps and ideas out there around this. And uh, and then I'm, and then I'll uh, let Craig lead some Q&A or however you guys want to do your groups at that point. Okay. So a couple of practical helps around this. Uh, this idea is that if, how do we care for our families? How do we shepherd? We're going to shepherd the flock of God that's among you. Our family, how do we uniquely shepherd and care for them? I want to mention one in regard to our wives, for those who are married, and second, for those who have children. Um, the first is, you know, one of the things I've learned is that um, there's four things I want to mention. Um, serve, disciple, encourage, and pray for our wife. Uh, serve, disciple, encourage, and pray. And I want to give those four categories because I want to give the category and then let you determine how the best care for your wife. So I, what I'm not going to do, it, what I and I don't do this regardless of where I go or where I'm talking about this stuff, is I want to put those categories out there and challenge you to think about how do you serve, disciple, encourage, and pray for your wife in a way she feels loved and cared for. Because I don't want to share what I what may work in my own marriage. Your wife's totally different than my wife. She may need something else different. So I want to push you and challenge you to think about how does your wife need you to serve her and disciple her and encourage her and, and pray for her. But I want to put those four categories before you. I think they're really important and they capture a ton. And if you're wondering how to answer those questions, uh, 
I've got a, a small piece of advice. Uh, go ask her uh, instead of trying to guess. Just go and ask her. Uh, when was the last time you went to her and said, "How how can I, how can I serve you in a way that's that's helpful? How can I encourage you? How can I pray for you? Whatever it may be." So um, I would encourage you to go ask those questions if you haven't asked them in in some time. So uh, the other thing I want to mention is just I, I have a strong belief in if you have children who are still in the house that we are called to individually shepherd our children, not just as a group. The reason I say that is there's been this wonderful recovery, which I'm thankful for. There's been a wonderful recovery of what we call family worship, you know, that the, the whole family comes together and you read scripture and pray and sing or what you do devotions, yeah, whatever it might be. And I think that's wonderful. And I think there's a great recovery from that. But what I want to encourage you to do is to think about how you shepherd your children individually. So again, going back to those texts, that the call is that you shepherd each individual soul and we will give an account to Jesus for them. And that includes the individual souls of our children. And um, I, was, I was challenged by this by a friend of mine who's a pharmacist and a deacon, not even a pastor. I was staying at his house years ago when our kids were little. We stayed for a week. He had seven kids. And I watched him every morning. He woke up early and each one of the kids got a morning with him uh, for seven days a week, seven kids. And I watched the whole thing happen. And, um, you know, they, they'd read a book together. They'd read scripture together. They'd pray together. They'd talk. It would just be their morning with their dad before everything got going with school and work and all that. And I knew it was coming. So I had like half the kids at that time, you know, and uh, I knew it was coming. He's going to ask me why, you know, why I didn't do that. So I knew he wasn't going to take some weak excuse like, I have, I'm too busy or I had too many children. Like he had, he had way more children than I did. And so uh, I just, I just owned up. I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't do it. And uh, he challenged me that I should go home and do this. So I kind of humored him and I went home and thought, okay, the mornings in my house are utter chaos. I don't know about you guys, but like if children get to school, like clothed and fed um, and that's a win, you know, that was just a win. It's like, no way this is happening in the morning. So I picked the evenings. I was like, the evenings is going to be when this is going to happen, if any. So I have four kids, and this is when they were little. Four kids, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So every, every kid got a certain individual evening. And this is, they're young enough where they're all going to bed, you know, same time. So whoever's night it was, I told them they, that would be their night. They get to stay up 30 minutes later with me. And we, we, I would just have some stuff for us to do, spend some time together. So everybody else would go to bed and that child would be able to stay up 30 minutes later. So, you know, big deal, right? I'm thinking they're going to be into this for like two months and then it's going to get really old and they're, it's going to fizzle out. And um, not so, not so. So I would say for the next 10 years, um, I had those four nights and each one of my kids I met with and they were my greatest accountability. Like there'd be times I'd put them on bed, like I'd be exhausted. You know, I'm, I'm like praying and fasting that God would help them forget it was their night. You know, I was like, I don't have it in me to do this tonight, you know? And sure enough, I put them in bed and I walk out and I think I'm home free. And, you know, and one of the kids would be like, wait, dad, it's my night. I'm like, yep, you're right. It is. I have to go in. And so there were times I certainly didn't want to do it. They were my, they were my best accountability. But you know what, as I, as these kids are grown now, or, uh, my, uh, I have two kids out of the house, one getting ready to graduate high school um, and another one in high school. And uh, man, those are some of the sweetest times as I look back on that. We read scripture, we prayed together. I learned something really valuable and I want to leave this with you guys. Regardless of how meaningful your family worship is together, you get a glimpse at your children's hearts when you're alone with them that you do not get when the rest of the family is together. And that's what I learned by the individual care of, of, of my kids through that time. And um, that proved to be such a sweet time. And, and what I was convicted of is, is I'm giving my life. I spend all this individual time with all these different church members, you know, shepherding them, pouring into them, just like you guys do. And then all of a sudden I realized, yeah, I, if my family is, if I'm first going to answer for them, why am I not also investing individually in each one of them? So I was challenged by my friend. I've challenged other pastors in that way. And so I'll, I challenge you in that way and I'll, I'll leave that with you and stop there, Craig. Oh, thank you. All right. What I want to do is uh, throw it out there. I know, guys, uh, we may have a chance to get in groups, but first, uh, I want to give you a chance to ask questions of Brian. So 
wave your hand and ask a question. And unmute yourself and ask it. If I don't see, I'll just call on you and ask you to ask a question. I'm waiting. There he is, Harlan. Tell him about your your. Uh, oh, your I so I adopted two boys who were homeless in Hawaii, and we um, we read the Bible every uh, dinner time. We read a chapter a day. So I'm thinking about the the thirty minute thing where I can spend with them. Um, in addition, so what would you suggest if we read a Bible uh, chapter? Is there like a book I can read with them, or do you have any suggestions on that? I guess. Yeah, great question, man. Thank you. So yes, I would. What I typically did was I would usually read a Bible passage with them individually. Um, sometimes I would pick a passage. I would pick uh, the passage I was preaching for that Sunday, if it was simple enough to read it, and then just just have a conversation with them about it. Uh, you'd be amazed, depending on the age of the kids. You know, you'd, you'd be amazed at, at how helpful that is to sermon prep to hear it. Uh, to hear a kid's thought on uh, on that text for, the, for that particular day but it gives a chance harlan to you know have the individual dialogue about about scripture in some way so pick something there but then yeah i would we would pick a whole nother book and i would let them pick a book to read whatever they wanted so it you know so it could be age appropriate and so i would let them pick the book something they wanted to read you know something that would be fun for them to read and then depending on the age that they were uh they would read some and then i would read some if they were older so i didn't read very well growing up and so it was important to me that I actually heard my kids reading as, I, as they were growing up and learning to read. And so depending on the age, uh, I think you can do that. So pick an age appropriate book, something that they want to read and, uh, and interact with them, you know, about it. So we'd pray, you know, I, we'd pray together. I'd ask them how they're doing. Like, so that's a moment to say, you know, how can, you know, is there one way I can, I can pray for you? And you, you get to teach them. How do you think about it? telling somebody, asking somebody to pray for you and those kind of things? So yeah, but read a book with them that they'll have fun reading. That's a great idea. All right, Larry, Hale's got a question. Larry, unmute yourself and talk to us. Hey, Brian, thanks for being with us and sharing with us. Hey, Larry. Um, so, so Brian, the things you're talking about, man, I, I think it's awesome. There are actually some things I've been trying to implement with my family, but uh, with my kids, I got three kids. They're kind of the teenage years. Uh, one of them's 12 almost 13. So um, I'm not doing it as well as I, I want to, um, but I am trying to trying to implement it. Uh, I've got one that's getting ready to go into college this next year. And uh, I want to get your thoughts on that. Is that something that I should try to, you know, continue to do with her? I mean, the relationship's starting to change, but it's still sort of under our roof, you know, from some respect, should I still try to do video chats with her and, and do the same thing? That's a great question. Um, so one quick story, as I was doing, did this for years, and as my older children became teenagers, what I started seeing in, is that they were still doing this with me. Uh, they were glad, they were gladly doing it. They weren't complaining, but Larry, I could tell they just weren't into it as much, you know, becoming teenagers and, and all this, but they knew it was, it was kind of embedded in the culture of our family. It's something they were going to keep doing. And I went and talked to my wife when I said, you know, I can tell that they're just some just not into it like before you know and i'm i'm not sure what to do and i was really i really felt lost and i asked her this shows how wise she is you ready for this i said i don't know what to do she says i got an idea why don't you ask them what they want to do and i went that's pretty wise okay i will <laughs> like simple right but brilliant if you think about it, it i have to honestly own i hadn't it did not cross my mind to do that and she said ask them so i ended up going to them and saying, you know, hey, what, you know, I'd like to keep doing this with you, but I, I know you're getting older and I want to do this to where this is still enjoyable for you, but I want to have that time with you. And you know what, Larry, every one of them had had their own idea what they wanted to do. And uh, that was really helpful. So my, um, so one example, my oldest daughter, uh, she said, you know, because it was the same night, same day, every week, same night, you know, that was the routine. She actually wanted a spontaneity with it. So, um, you know, and that's the thing. It's like, that doesn't have to make sense to me. I just need to hear and listen to that and then try to meet that need. So I started doing some response. So, so we didn't do it every week. So like 
but like one maybe once a month uh i would spontaneously like when she got home from school hey you want to go you want to go get some coffee together you know and go hang out a little bit she you know she loved it so still to this day she's grown she's 20 she's an emt but lives in the city same city we live in but she's on her own lives in her own apartment and i still text her like the night before hey you want to go breakfast and she loves it like she's 20 you know so i, I would you know figure out which what your kids want and let them speak to that and then try to accommodate it. and i would say every kid's different yeah, thank you appreciate it that's great all right, another question. Wave your hand. Ask your question. Somebody's got a hand up. Okay, unmute yourself. Hi, this is Amel. Hey, Mel. Hey, uh, 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 I heard that you have a daughter, at least one daughter. Um, I have two boys and two girls. Uh, can you speak really briefly about how, uh, how your wife has partnered in this process with you? Um, my girls are getting older and, and, uh, so, so some topics are beginning to be off limits, um, at, where my wife has been helpful. And, and I don't know if, if you have any, any ways that you've seen that helpful for what you're trying to do with uh, shepherding uh, your family. Yeah, that's great. So I have three daughters, Mel. So my okay. son is 22 now. He's the oldest. And then I have three daughters. So 20, 18, 15. And, um, yeah, it's, I mean, as you can imagine, it's, it's hard to put into words the, the, what my wife has done to parent our kids and care for them, especially the girls as they go into teenagers. She has done a, just a brilliant job of, of caring for them in those specific ways that, like you said, is ideal for a mom to care for, a, you know, when, when girls start going through puberty and all those kinds of things, having those conversations. Um, yeah, I didn't shy away from that at all. She's just, she's really been great at that. The uh, two other things I'll say is uh, my wife is incredibly wise. So she's brought a ton of wisdom to our parenting that I would say I lack. So, um, I mean, honestly, like had a conversation last night that she brought something up and I'm like, yeah, I, I, I wasn't thinking about that. And that's something I should do, you know, kind of thing. So she, she's brought a ton of wisdom and just understanding to them. Um, the third thing I would say, and this is no small thing, one of the ways she supported me is she supported me meeting with the kids all, all those years. You know, so you, you, I tell guys, you probably will not have your wife probably will not complain that that she's losing you for 30 minutes at night for you to go and spend time with your kids. But you know what? That's not an assumption to make for everybody. So like she blessed me to go and spend time with them like she encouraged it. So you know, Mill, I didn't, I didn't go come down from doing that. And she's like irritated that, you know, you spend all day with the church and then your kids, you know, it's like anything left for me kind of, kind of thing. Like I never got that. So I would actually say one of the ways she supported me doing these things was she just, you know, she, she was the most biggest encourager about me spending time with, she saw the value. And quite frankly, most wives I know will probably see that, but you never know. But I have to acknowledge that's one of the ways she supported the work I was doing with them. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Great question, guys. Thanks, Emil. Somebody else. All right, Martin Chapel, Bangkok. Um, what would you say is probably some of the, the best things or most important things you did with your wife? You know, we've talked a lot about the kids, and of course, about your wife supporting you. But from the perspective of you speaking into your wife's life and you know a lot of that is protecting and you know just being there uh so what would you say are some of the the most helpful things that you and your wife did together to help navigate those stressful waters of ministry yeah good question and i have to say some of the answers i have came out of uh learning that i wasn't doing some of them well so, um, which I guess is some of the best lessons we learn, right? Um, <clears throat> I will say that, um, you know, I, I really stress that I, I just think every marriage is different. So like, I know, I know wives who would love nothing more than their husbands to like every day, take t set time aside to sit down and read the word together and explain it and talk about it and, you know, and pray together. And 
and, and that's not my wife. Like she, she knew the Bible better than I do, you know, and always has. So it's like, uh, she's a teacher of the word like that. That's so that's not something we, we did that at, at different times, but it's just not something she was asking of me. Uh, so I think you have to, uh, you know, I think you have to know each other, know what the other one is wanting. Um, so some of the ways that I think were helpful is when I would, when I would do intentional things to show that I was putting her first before the church. Uh, I think that was big. The only reason I learned that lesson is I, I know how painful it was when I was clearly not doing that. You know, I was clearly putting the church first before I put her first and eventually learned, saw that that was, um, that was really, that was painful and hard. Uh, <clears throat> defending your wife, uh, defending your wife in whatever situation, uh, whatever it costs might come from that. Um, that's something that I really learned was something that meant a lot to her. So again, I, I think it's a, I, I, I really want to stress that I, every wife is very different when it comes to this stuff. But I think that's why we have really got to study. You know, we have to study our own life and to know what is going to be most helpful to her. Um, it's part of knowing and seeing and loving her and um, still trying to figure that out. But I, I do realize that um, being able to provide time where, where she saw that I was not just putting them first, but sacrificing maybe, you know, uh, not caring as much about what church people think about a decision I would make because it was what was in their best interest. Um, you know, and I have to say, there's a lot of times I didn't see that at first. Like it took conversations with her for me to, to see that I was missing that. So she was a real gift and, and being patient with me to talk with me about it. Um, but those are some of the categories of things, at least for her, that I saw. And you know what, Martin, those are little things, aren't they? Like, just some of those aren't, I mean, just, you know, allowing time to where uh, they're not competing with time with the church, defending her in a, in a moment where it's the right time. You know, it's, it's something, to, maybe something small, but she feels valued and defended. I was amazed at how some of those small things mattered. That's great. Thank you, Martin. Somebody else. Wave your hand, get my attention. There's Dennis Andrews. Hey, um, you had mentioned that it was a little bit uh, into your ministry. I think that's what you were saying. It was a little bit into your ministry that the, just the power of these verses that you shared with us really hit you. Um, I guess the question I have is, as you were ministering at the church, that realization of what the scripture's teaching was that a big change in how you structured your time and the way that you dealt with the church versus family and, and structuring that those ministries, was that, was that something that you had to work through and, and kind of educate and build the church with? And, and then the follow-up to that is how did you do that? <laughs> All good questions. I think um, I, I would say two main things happened. I think when those texts started to have an impact on me, one was how it affected my heart, uh, which obviously, as we know, is, is the, the overflow of our actions comes out of that. So I, I, was, I was gripped convictionally, and that, that started to change things. The spirit was at work there. But yeah, but I think um, there's a finding a tangible action, a practice that changes um, is, one, it becomes very tangible then, but two, your family notices, you know? So I think that's another thing is you can love your family well, um, theoretically, but if, if, if they don't feel that love from you, um, it, it's not having the impact you want it to have. Like you want, you got kids at home, you know, you want them to know that they want to, they want to experience that you're prioritizing them or whatever that, you know, looks like. So I'd say those, those two things, well, and of course, obviously, as we know, the, the heart has to turn first before any actions change. So I remember that, you know, I just felt a ton of pressure and fear of man uh, around, you know, just trying to meet all the expectations. This church, you know, I mean, people are coming after me. I mean, it just, it stirs so much stuff. You're not prepared for that. And so, you know, I crushed myself trying to just meet those expectations. I wouldn't have told you I was like, you know, I was neglecting my family um, that I knew I was, but, but I was, you know, I was in those years uh, in different times, not all the time, but, you know, there were, there were pockets of that. So what I learned too, is when I started to change. So one of the things I started to do, Dennis, is I started to look for tangible things to do that I wanted my kids to notice. So quick example, I used to have my phone 
you know, I'd set my phone next to me at dinner, you know, just in case there's, you know, whatever emergency call or something. We're sitting having dinner as a family. And so for years, you know, my kids knew that, you know, sometimes a phone would ring and I would feel I would answer it. Um, and there was a time where I realized that um, that I was doing that and that, that was making a statement to them. So one dinner, I took my phone and put it in the other room and left it. And it wasn't sitting next to me. We we're just eating dinner and the uh, the phone rings while it's in there. And uh, of course, my kids look at me like, you know, dad, phone's ringing, you know, like almost in a panic, like it's all the way in there and you're here, you know, what are you doing? And, uh, and I just act like I don't even hear it. And I was like, oh, well, it's okay. I'll, I'll check it later. You know, just, it was a totally different experience for them. And, uh, and I remember one of my kids said, but dad, what if somebody died? And I remember looking at them and saying, then they're not going anywhere. I'll check it after dinner. And, you know, that small, that small shift, right. That, that's, that doesn't sound like a big mess just to put in a phone in the other room, but it, it made a statement to them. I'm, I'm yours. This is my time with you. Nobody gets to get in the way of that. Like those small things I started to learn, you know, trying to find strategic ways to make, communicate that to them. That's great. And if that's the only thing you guys get from this, <laughs> don't miss that one. That was really put your cool. put your phone away. And, uh, oh my goodness! That's right. Totally. I wish somebody would have said that to me. Not that I would have listened, but I wish somebody would at least said it to me. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? I'm looking. So Brian, I'm gonna. I'm I see. Going to... I see Rocky's hand. Okay. Right. Good. Good. Rocky, go for it. Hey, Brian, thank you. This is all very good. Hey, man. This is helpful. Uh, how have you shepherded the congregation? Because obviously you're going to be making decisions that you're going to intentionally choose to not do certain things for the church in order to care for your family. How have you had conversations with your elders or with the congregation and shepherding them to get them on the same page to see that this is part of pastoral ministry? Yeah. Um, look look for the opportunities to teach on it, first of all. So, you know, family things are going to happen and you're going to have an opportunity to make a choice to communicate to them what's most important to you. Um, so quick example, uh, I've been willing to share with you guys something. Uh, my oldest daughter, we were having some really, um, we were having a difficult time with her. And on a Sunday morning, I was at church already. And um, she and my wife had a fight and uh, she left and uh, my wife calls me like 15 minutes before the service starts and says, I'm preaching and leading Lord's Supper that morning. And she says, um, Abby's gone. I can't find her. And uh, she, she wasn't driving at the time. So she like left and ran off somewhere. And, um, and you know, 15 minutes before. And so I said, OK, just, uh, you know, and I basically said, give me give me about three or four minutes. Let me just think and figure out what what I, what I need to do here. And uh, she was out looking for and all those kinds of things. Called my elders in and looked and I had about three or four minutes just to think about kind of gather my thoughts and figure out what do I do. You know, so let's preach, let's do everything. And, and my daughter's missing. And it was a pretty scary time. Um, anyways, they could by the time the elders came in, I, I told them what had happened. And I said, she's gone. We can't find her. Uh, she's not answering her phone. Uh, so I'm leaving and I'm going to go look for her with my wife. So uh, whatever you guys do, you're good, faithful elders. I'm sure you're going to do a great job. I trust you, whatever you're going to do, but I'm leaving. And I turned around and walked out and jumped in my car and we started looking for, her. and I actually was the one that found her. Uh, she was hiding out in a, you know, at a coffee shop somewhere down the road. Um, and uh, my elders handled it, you know, and it was funny because they, you know, they actually ended up said that just told the church that it was a family emergency, you know, and um, and did say any more. So anyways, we found her. I go back to church and I actually I got there right at the end of the service and I actually shared with everybody what had happened. So, by the way, this 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 would not have happened 10 years before. I probably would have made a wrong decision and not have done that. I would have tried to hide it. I wouldn't have wanted people to know about it. So there was some transparency and honesty, things that I've had to had to do some work to, to see it was valuable. I told the church what had happened and um, and I had people coming up to me and the the um, the opportunity I didn't realize it, but that opportunity to communicate to the church that my family's 
is most important um, was very clearly communicated that day. And I had church members that came up to me and just said, thank you. Like not, you know, I can't believe you didn't preach a sermon today. I had, had somebody come up and say, I know you didn't preach a sermon, but you preached a sermon just so you know. Uh, so look for the opportunities to teach your church really in the moment. And, and I would say um, that was one of those moments. Last thing I'll say, really easy thing everybody can do. Use every day your vacation. Um, pastors are notorious for not using your vacation time. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on this call if you use all your vacation time. But uh, use all your vacation time. That's the only time your family doesn't have to share you with everybody else. I notoriously did not use my vacation time for years. And I had a friend call me on it. And he was right. So um, one easy way to communicate to your church, my family's important to me. My own personal care and rest and health is important to me. I'm taking every day of my vacation time whether people like it or not. Thank you. Wow. So practical and helpful. Thank you for sharing those. All right. Yeah. We still have some time. Thank you. We, we appreciate you staying on longer with us. Yeah. Uh, others, wave your hand. Other questions that you have. I know in one of your, uh, that week 29, in that, section that you deal with uh the family you talk about the pastor and family losses is there anything else that you have that you would challenge us related to the where you say pastors must face tragic loss straightforwardly both for personal healing and to help their family and congregation grieve properly it goes along a little bit with what you just explained but is there anything else that you could encourage them in that i would just say that that when there's a great when there's a loss in the church that affects your family and you. A pastor is uniquely in a hard situation that we have to. So like there was a, one of my dear friends was a deacon in the church, my age, he was killed in a car crash, left a wife, a five-year-old and a one-year-old. And my family, my kids knew this family well, they were neighbors. So he was beloved in the church. So as a pastor, I'm dealing with my own personal grief. I'm dealing with my family's grief over that loss. And then I, I get to shepherd the whole church through that loss. That is a unique burden that's almost unlike anything else anybody would experience. So um, you have to kind of be aware of that's true for failures and that's true for just losses in general. There's a grief. We have to embrace sadness as the way to deal with those things. And if pastors don't, you know, they, I think we don't help people grieve very well if we can't embrace our own sadness. But that is a unique burden. Those layers of grief, we got to learn how to do that. I see Sean's hand. Sean. Brian, thank you so much. Uh, this has been inspiring. Uh, you seem to make kind of a foundational statement and then launched into um, some tips. You said, be very aware of what's going on inside us. Can you unpack that a little bit? Sure. So I'm convinced that one of the greatest assets to any pastor is self-awareness. What is going on in, in his own, our own activity in our own soul. So we, um, What's going on internally? You know, what emotions are we feeling? What pain are we aware of that has affected us in our life? Uh, if we can't be aware of, of, I call it the awareness of the activity of our soul. So, um, and the best way to avoid that internal world in us is noise and busyness. Mm -hmm. So if noise and busyness is the best way to avoid the internal work in our soul. We can do a pretty, what we can, of all things, ironically, right guys, ministry can keep us from knowing our own internal world. Well, it, you know, that internal world is, is, is how we receive God's grace, is how we commune with Christ through the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's that internal spiritual world of our own soul. So we have to care for our own soul. We have to know the activity, what's going on. So when that person attacks us or criticizes our sermon, like what stirs up in here and understanding and feeling that, like, man, I was, I was hurt by that. Like, or I'm, I'm mad because of what they said or whatever it is. Like we have to understand that and work through that. We've got to be able to talk about it with somebody safe. We got to be able to take it to the Lord. Like if we don't deal with our internal world, what happens in that it just, it shoots out, you know, in crazy ways. And that's where pastors lash out. Honestly, that's where in, in my experience in the ministry I'm doing, that's, that leads to burnout. It leads to horrific decisions that pastors make from moral, you know, uh, in, immoral decisions. I mean, all that usually comes from a pastor unable to see and understand what was going on in his soul, his own soul. 
And so that's what I mean by that. Thank you. That's so good. Great question, Sean. All right. One last chance. I'm going to give you to ask one more question before we have Brian pray for us. These were so helpful. So let me, guys, let me ask you to do one thing. If you all could, uh, if you can turn your camera on so I could get a screenshot of your smiling faces so that I can send this to Brian and you never know how I'll use it. But uh, go ahead and smile for me. Uh, there we go. Anybody else can turn there? I know there's Jay. There's, uh, come on, Don's coming. Nick, Nick may be working. Hey, he's still, there he is. All right, smile, one, two. That's a thing of beauty. I'll send that to you, Brian. <laughs> you can please Sounds share good. that. Please share that with your family. And yep. uh, I, we appreciate you giving. I think it's 6 p.m. there or 7 p.m. now. So I think it's time to, for you to spend time with one of your kids. <laughs> they go to bed at seven still. They're pretty <laughs> They're pretty scattered now, man. They're, they're, so it, it's a quiet house now, but that's the way it's supposed to work, I'm told. So I know. You know, I know. So, that's great. Yep. Well, here's what we'd love for you to do. Um, and I, I let me ask one minute, Jamie McArath. Jamie, you've been uh, going through coaching with Brian. Could you tell, tell us about that experience just so that they can hear that? Yeah, so uh, I went through the first year of the uh, practical shepherding program. Um, there was reading, there was a reading list, there were uh, response, you know, things that we would write based on the chapters we were reading, and then Brian was teaching. And I think the biggest thing for me is, um, uh, and again, my preparation was on the mission field. I did not have a long, deep uh, pastoral in America runway that led to what God has brought us to here at Olivet now. And so what was most helpful for me was that uh, just strong, clear line from the Bible to the ministry, the Bible to the call, the Bible to the heart, the Bible to the family, the Bible to the church, the Bible to the mission. And uh, it was it was uh, great teaching, great preparation, on the job training, and then it was it has been a great accountability and encouragement group as I've gone forward uh, into the second year, and now just starting even in a third year uh, mm -hmm. with a group to be able to bounce things around and just bring issues to the group and hear other people's perspectives. It's been tremendously valuable to me. Thank you, Jamie. So can you tell us if, if guys wanted to participate in something like that, how'd they do it, Brian? Yeah, so we do, uh, we start our, we're in our fourth year of the cohort, uh, starts in January. So um, the next cohort we would do last a year and it would, it would, we would launch it again. We would start again in January. Registration for that will open this fall. So if you want to be a part of that, that's, that's probably the best window to do that. The, uh, the, uh, the practically trained pastors, though, Craig, what you held up, that 52-week field guide, is kind of the written version to take you through the 10 books. Yeah, so that takes you through 10 of our books, our core books, and that's what we take you through in the cohort as well. But obviously, the cohort is more interactive. So that's really kind of two options for the same thing. That's and and the, again, since we all think about these things, the, the cohort process itself is, is offered to us for free. Um, you know, we did not have to pay to be a part of this. It's, it's it is free. Ministry. Fractal Shepherding and Nam have partnered, yeah. so it's free to pastors. So you have to get the books on your own, but there's no cost for the cohort. That's right. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, Brian. All right. So what I'd love for you to do, Brian, we're at the end of our time. I'm going to ask you if you would pray for our pastors as we close out our time and just thank you again from all of us I know they all want to express that to you but thank you for your gift of time for us and your ministry to so many yeah you're welcome I'm glad, glad to be on with you guys and if you guys need anything Craig and Jamie's got my info if you need some feel free to reach out okay let me pray Lord thanks for these brothers and thank you for their faithful ministries and their families and ask the Lord you bless them they're their hands to the plow as they do ministry work, help their ministries to flourish. May their churches be gospel light in that place. And Lord, I also pray that you take our conversation and move them to know how to be faithful uh, husbands and fathers to their families, to love them well, to shepherd there. I pray, Lord, that their families would feel loved and cared for by them as a result. And Lord, I pray that you'd knit this group together as in friendship, 
that they would support one another and care for one another as pastors through the unique difficulties, but the certainly unique joys that come with ministry and serving Jesus. In his name, we pray these things. Amen. Thank you so much, Brian. Man, thank you so much for being here today, for uh, gathering. I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your, your day. Thanks for taking time to be here. Bless See you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. See you.